Welcome to another episode of the MMA Lockcast. I'm your host, Manpreet, a.k.a. MMA Lock of the Night, and your boy on Twitter at MMALOTN. Today, we're going to be going over UFC Nashville, which goes down this weekend, headlined by Showtime Pettis and Wonderboy Thompson. Sounds like a fucking superhero movie of some sort, but uh, nope. They're probably two of the more entertaining guys in the in the game, but uh, matchup that kind of doesn't make sense. Regardless, let's just fucking get into this shit. Um, not going to be doing the casuals today, uh, taking a week off, um, but we should be back with it next week. Uh, let's quickly go over my last event, which was UFC London. So I had two lock of the night plays and a dog of the night play. Uh, unfortunately, it was nulled due to the fact that uh, Tom Breeze pulled out last minute, uh, but it was a parlay of Tom Breeze and uh, Arnold Allen. I had two units at um, plus 199 and then I had two or 0.75 units on uh, at uh, plus 204 so with the price getting a little bit better I was a little uh, you know I was a little tempted to put some more on it and I had to you know I I, I just felt that it was such a, a shoe in uh, not a shoe in but like uh, I was very confident in that partly and I felt like just putting on a little bit more on that play rather than towards something else was the better move and you know unfortunately Tom Breeze pulled out so it's not really a dog of the night play anymore just because there's no plus money on it uh, but so I ended up being two units at minus one, 137 and 0.75 units at minus 132 for Allen regardless uh, we hit that was a great fight by Arnold Allen, kind of what I expected him to do. Um, you know, very disciplined, uh, the quicker striker, landed more damage. You know, it was it was a pretty easy fight for Arnold Allen, in my opinion. You know, Jordan, Jordan Rinaldi just couldn't get his takedowns going. Arnold Allen did, did the best that he could to keep the fight on the feet and keep it in a range where he could be successful over three rounds. And lo and behold, he was. So great hit for me there. Moving on to my first lock of the night play, I had Claudio Silva, five units at minus 147. Uh, whew, that one was a sweat. Um, you know, I was, <laughs> most of you guys will know <laughs> if you guys follow me on Twitter. As soon as Claudio Silva got him down, I tweeted out game set dot 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 and then just tweeted that out and then just had the next one ready to say match and then just have my fucking statistics off that fight. But uh, unfortunately, you know, Danny Roberts did, a pretty good job of getting out of some of these uh, submission attempts. The, somebody had spotted out a certain thing in terms of the way that Claudio Silva was going for his grips when he was doing the, the arm triangle choke when, when that was one of his submission attempts. Yeah, I did see something weird about that too. You know, he kept switching in between locks and it just seemed like there was a better lock that he could have gone to. Uh, you know, I'm no jiu-jitsu expert or anything like that, but just through everything that I've seen, uh, it just seems like there was other locks that he could have gone for. Uh, but regardless, you know, Danny Roberts was able to gut it out, get out of that submission, like he did many submissions in this fight, which was very surprising to me. I'll give it up to Danny Roberts strictly for that. But then you got to take away all that fucking praise as soon as you get to that third round and Danny Roberts drops Claudio Silva and then willingly goes into his guard and then eventually gets tapped via armbar. All the controversy around it, say what the fuck you want to say. I'm just happy I got the win. You know, I could have been uh, easily on the other side in a different fight and it's not going to go my way, unfortunately, for... Uh, Danny Roberts betters it didn't go their way but it went my way so I'm happy with that <laughs> it was a uh, plus 3.4 units on Claudio Silva for that straight lock the night play fucking amazing uh and then you know kind of like a nothing to really gloat about with this Nathaniel Wood fight you know uh five units at minus 254 super chalk but I thought it was a fight that there's no way he could lose this he beats El Teco everywhere or Teco I think I'm just adding the L because I'm racist as fuck but um you know he beat Teko pretty much everywhere and he even subbed him he subbed out a guy who has jujitsu tattooed across his chest set and done that's how easy of a fight that was and that you know it was a no-brainer for me to play him straight like i just felt that was the way to go with that fight um so yep that was five units at minus 254 so we end the event at plus 7.4 units um you know great night for me swept the night fucking who knows how that Tom Breeze fight would have gone but it is what it is we end up with three bets for the night and I fucking killed it I, I I'm I'm on, I'm on a bit of a high you know I'm coming off a losing event which was a slight loss before that three straight winning event so I feel like I'm really back in the groove especially being on the plus side again for this year that's just fucking amazing you know that that start of the year was such a tumultuous stretch that it really fucking you know it 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 hurt but I knew 
that I am capable of, you know, putting shit together and making, uh, you know, of having a good track record. And I feel like if you guys look back at my previous record that I can definitely attest to that. So, um, you know, my lifetime lock of the night record goes to 85 and 37, which is a 70% hit rate. Uh, you know, I'm aiming, like I always thought I was capable of being able to hit between 80 and 85%. And I'm still on the path for that. You know, it's going to take a long time to get up there due to the fact that I have had so many bets right by now. Uh, but I'm, I'm not stopping. You know, I mean, like I'm, I'm going to get it. So, uh, yeah, great night at UFC London. That takes us right into our fucking next event. I think this is the eighth, or, yeah, the second last event of this stretch of UFC events since I believe the beginning of February. It's been ridiculous how many fights we're getting, but I'm not complaining because it's pretty much almost my job to fucking make sure or hope that there's a UFC event that weekend so that I can put out some picks, I can get make people some money, and eventually, you know, create a little bit of business for myself. Uh, you know, you should do what you're good at for free, and I feel like I'm good at enough, good at this enough that people should be fucking pay me a little bit of change. I mean, here there, but I stick with my paid versus free picks policy, as you guys know. Uh, you know, I pride myself on that because I think that's kind of how it should be with touting, um, and I think that's why most of you guys like me still. So, regardless, where uh, this will be my second straight hit if this weekend is a success. Um, I believe there's a Bellator this weekend as well, if I'm not mistaken. No odds are currently out, but I'm definitely going to take a look into that. So I might actually have two plays this weekend. So you want to tail this weekend uh, if I'm playing both Bellator and UFC Nashville. Uh, as if I hit both, I'm going on to UFC, uh, fuck, what is it, Philadelphia? I think it's UFC Philadelphia. Uh, headline Barbo Barboza and Gaethje. That would be a paid event if both of my events hit this weekend. But I'm not going to force anything on the Bellator card. Uh, but if there is something that I spot that I really like, I will definitely pull the trigger on it. So, uh, UFC Nashville. Showtime Pettis versus Wonderboy Thompson. This fight makes absolutely zero fucking sense. I said it. <laughs> it makes zero sense. There's no reason this fight should be happening other than the fact that these guys are somewhat entertaining stand-up strikers or stand-up fighters, and they're going to have a great fucking fight, um, you know, if it goes a certain way. We could see it just being a stalemate on the feet where one is just waiting for the other to engage, and we just have these two guys kind of just leaping around and putting on some sort of fucking karate show or something. But... Um, I think it's going to be more than that. I think that we're going to see, uh, you know, a rejuvenated Stephen, uh, Wonderboy Thompson kind of defending the welterweight division. You know, you know, Pettis is coming up just for this one off technically, but I think Wonderboy is just going to be like, yo, fuck it. Like this is my division. Uh, you know, I'm not going to lose to a guy coming up from fucking lightweight. Uh, so I think he's really going to come out strong in this fight. Uh, and I think he will stand a good chance against Anthony Pettis, but does he deserve to be a minus 400 favorite? That's why the fuck you guys are listening, right? So let's fucking just kick it off from the beginning, right at the top of, or bottom of the card, top of the card. I've never understood that. You know what I mean? Top of the card, bottom of the card, because there's been so many formats where you see the main event at the top of the card, and then you've seen a main event at the bottom of the card. I'm just here for the predictions, guys. Fuck, I'm not trying to solve anything here. Uh, all right, first fight of the night. Eric Shelton versus Jordan Espinoza. Starting off with Jordan Espinoza, he's 13 and 5. Um, currently, whoa, what is that? He's currently sitting at, let's see what his odds are at, plus 164, while the comeback on Eric Shelton is minus 181. So Jordan, uh, Jordan Espinoza has two fights in the Dana White Contender Series over the last two years. Uh, his last fight against Riley Dutro, he pretty much beat the guy in the last two seconds. Um, he is amazing, uh, very not amazing. <laughs> that's kind of a stretch for a guy that's thirteen and five. Excuse me. Uh, he's he he's a he's a ball of energy in that first round. Uh, you know, we've seen him get a first round finish over Nick or so in his first uh, appearance on the Contender Series. Uh, you know, very strong wrestling in that first round. I'd say one and a half rounds. Uh, powerful striker, as he's shown with that victory over Riley Dutro uh, with two seconds left in the entire fight. Uh, but the thing is, his output significantly diminishes uh, from after that one and a half 
mark. You know, he's still able to throw with heat. Uh, I still think he'd be able to land a takedown here and there. But, uh, you know, the, the, the pop and the energy behind most of his actions after that one and a half round mark really diminished. And that's where it's kind of a, a sketchy thing for me. You know, I don't, I don't, I can't, I, originally I was, I was interested at that plus 170-ish mark with, uh, with Jordan Espinoza. But the thing is, I feel like uh, Eric Shelton's a guy that I don't really have a good read on. You know, I, I still need to look into this fight a little bit more. You know, we do know he's a lankier 125er, likes to use his range a little bit, has decent grappling. But the thing with him is he's very inconsistent. And, you know, we don't really know what kind of guy we're going to get. You're talking about a guy since, you know, coming off the Ultimate Fighter, he's gone 2-2. Two and two. He's lost to Alexander Pontoja, lost to Jared Brooks, lost, lost to Alex Perez, and he's only coming over wins over Joseph Morales and Janelle Lausa, who I don't really rate much at all. So, uh, you know, on the Ultimate Fighter show, he lost to Tim Elliott uh, in that semifinal round, I believe it was. So I, I, this fight is a bit of a pass for me currently sitting, you know, I am going to look into it a little bit more because I am in intrigued by it a bit. Like, I want to look into Shelton a little bit more because, if I'm not mistaken, he does train in Denver. Yes, he does train... Or Oklahoma. What am I talking about? Fighting out of East Malloy, Illinois. Wow, that's completely throwing me off. <laughs> Regardless, I think that, uh, you know, he may have the better gas tank here, uh, but the issue is, is he going to be able to survive? You know, he hasn't really been finished as of late, but he also, um, you know, he's going up against a guy that packs a lot of power and could, you know, control that first half of the round or first round and a half of the fight. So I'm, I don't know which way to lean right now, uh, but I'm going to go with Jordan Espinosa by decision. Would I bet it? Maybe not. You know, just stay tuned on my Twitter timeline at MMALOTN throughout this week and you guys will kind of know a, a little bit clearer what I think of that fight. But as of right now, you know, Eric Shelton has just been too inconsistent to trust at, you know, a minus 180 price range. Uh, so kind of a dog or pass situation here. Uh, but just know what you're getting with that dog if you are going to play that dog is a guy that is going to show a significant diminishing, uh, a significant, jeez, uh, <laughs> completely fumbling all my words, but uh uh, a significant drop in cardio and output after the one and a half round mark. So expect big shots from him still, but they're not going to come as often as they did in that first round and a half. So I, I'm still going to take Jordan Espinosa by decision, but uh, fuck, tough fight, tough fight to call. Next up, we got Chris Gutierrez against Ryan McDonald. So we're going to start off with Ryan McDonald real quick. Uh, you know, I've seen a couple of his fights on the amateur circuit. I'm still trying to get around to finding. I've seen the highlights of his Trevor Ward fight. Uh, you know, he landed a big takedown in that fight uh, and then eventually won that fight in the second round by choke. Uh, but before that, you know, he was fighting a lot of bums on the fucking regional scene. Uh, he beat this guy, Matt Murphy, in his second last fight, uh, who was sitting on a record of seven, nine, seven and nine. And TKO retired him after the third round or before the third round. <laughs> it's just. Like, when you see some of the guys that he fights, it's kind of like it gives you glimpses of Jordan Wright, if you guys remember that guy from the uh, from the Contender Series. Uh, it's it's very interesting to see uh, him go up against some of these guys and then get dropped by some of these guys, too. Like, Matt Murphy rocked him and dropped him twice in one round. Uh, you know, in that first round where he was probably the most, uh, you know, where he had the most energy because apparently that guy missed weight for that fight as well. But regardless, you know, I, I'm still trying to get a read on Ryan McDonald. You know, he he seems very hittable, even though he does he can throw some good strikes of his own. Uh, he has a couple uh, submission victories on his record, so he has a little bit of a ground game. Uh, but I don't know, man. Against a guy with, like Chris Gutierrez, who has really good footwork, really good striking, the only real uh, the only real uh, issue here would be Chris Gutierrez's uh, takedown defense. And if Ryan McDonald is going to go for those takedowns uh, in those opportune moment, moments, is he going to get lit up too much by Chris Gutierrez and he's just too scared to close the distance and go for any type of takedown or at least any type of significant takedown to actually achieve uh, or, to, you know, to successfully land that takedown? Um, you know, we've seen Chris Gutierrez get taken down in his last couple of fights, uh, the Harney Barcelos fight, you know, 
he cut Honey Barcelos bad from the bottom in that last fight. And Honey Barcelos kind of used that as like, a, all right, I need to get my shit together and finish this fight. Otherwise, they might fucking stop this fight. Uh, and he ended up getting the rear naked choke there. So my concern here with Gutierrez is when and if this fight hits the ground, is he going to have the chops to survive off of Ryan McDonald, who seems to be a little bit more well-versed on the ground? Um, and, you know, Chris Gutierrez has some trouble getting back to his feet. You know, he, he does, I believe he has a really good striking game. You know, he uses his kicks very well. Uh, he shows flashes of that, like, uh, calf kick that a lot of guys are using, especially like Mark D. Casey this last weekend against Joe Duffy. It seems uh, that he has a striking capability to beat a guy like Ryan McDonald, who's super hittable. But I don't know if Ryan McDonald is going to be going for takedowns. I feel like... You know, any intelligent fighter, especially even if you've been fighting fucking cans over the last 10 fights, you kind of know that, you know, you can even see it. You should feel it that you know that this guy has better striking than you, but he has a glaring weakness in that takedown aspect. And with submission victories on your record, it seems almost like a no-brainer that you should be going for those takedowns. So I, I just can't trust Chris Gutierrez currently sitting at minus 172-ish, uh, plus 158 for Ryan McDonald. So I may look into Ryan McDonald a little bit more, but it's just you just don't know the type of guy you're going to get, especially when you're, you know, you're getting a guy that's fighting fucking just five and four guys. Even the LFA fight, I think his opponent was five and four. Uh, you know, that Matt Murphy guy was seven and nine. Like, you're not getting quality goals out there if you're just fighting guys who have been pun been punching bags for other guys. So, pass of a fight for me. Uh, and I'm actually going to side with Ryan McDonald here. I hate to say that. But I'm going to side with him here, and I think he's just going to be the smarter fighter in terms of getting this fight to the ground. And the fact that it is easy for him to get the fight to the ground, he should be able to control it and or pull off of some sort of submission. I won't rate his submission or his grappling until I see it actually in the UFC against a guy like Chris Gutierrez or even somebody else better than him. But uh, let's uh, let's see how that goes. But I'm going to take Ryan McDonald by either... Dis I'm going to take him by decision. Fuck it. All right. Next up, we got Ronda Marcos versus Angela Hill. <sighs> Gotta wet my whistle, you know? <clears throat> it's a white hot chocolate with a double shot of espresso because I need that espresso considering the type of days that I have. Just saying. All right, starting off with Ronda Marcos, Canadian Iraqi, one of the more beautiful women in the UFC, and at least in my opinion. Uh... She's coming in against Angela Hill off of a draw to Marina Rodriguez in her last fight. We kind of know the game on Ronda Marcos. You know, she's a little bit unorthodox on the feet, but we know at the end of the day she wants to get a hold of you. She wants to control you, whether it's against a cage or with a takedown. But she has uh, a very strong-ish uh, grappling, clinch-heavy game. That's what she wants to do. She wants to get a hold of you and just control you, make things miserable, uh, you know, land pitter-patter shots, but do enough to win around to win around here and there. Not here and there, but as often as she could. Angela Hill likes to keep this straight on the feet. She has decent footwork. She, uh, you know, she uses her striking very well, in my opinion, uh, but she never has that pop on her shots to get the finishes that, you know, she probably could if she just, you know, either turned to kick over a little bit harder or, you know, Whatever it takes technically to get these finishes, I think she's very capable because she is quite precise in some in her fights too. So I think that, you know, this comes down to whether Randa Marcus is going to be able to get a hold of Angela Hill and drag her to the ground uh, and then control her there. Or if Angela Hill is going to be able to keep her feet moving, hit, you know, Randa Marcus from the outside. I believe she has a little bit of a reach advantage as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um yeah, Angela, well, it's, it's only a 0.5-inch reach advantage. But, you know, just just always staying moving, always having the cleaner, crisper strikes. I think she should be, be should be able to outstrike Rana Marcos on the feet. But, you know, Rana Marcos is almost a little bit too reckless on the feet where she will eat some punches to close that distance and then a hold, get a hold of you. And sometimes it pays off for, the, for her, sometimes it has not. I don't know if it will in this fight. I kind of trust Angela striking... Uh, more than I do of Randa Marcos's ability to close the distance without taking too much damage. Uh, minus 150 seems roughly right, which is where the odds currently are for Angela Hill. Uh, I am going to look into it a little bit more. I do want to see more tape. 
um, you know, I'm I'm intrigued in this matchup a little bit more than I'm actually talking about it. Uh, initially, I kind of just thought of it as a pass. You know, I thought like either girl was capable of uh, implementing their game plan and and running away with this fight. But I will look into it a little bit more. I want to kind of see how you know how well Angela Hill does with you know grappling opponents and grappling heavy opponents. Um, and how well she does getting out of those positions. But from what you know, what I have seen or remember of her from her last fight, um, and most recently is you know good footwork, good striking, but always just keeps the fight too close. Where it's just you know a judge's decision could go this way, could go that way. But you know she's always in very close fights, and you can't really be sure about making somebody you know a lock of the night play when they're having close fights against girls like Courtney Casey, Marina Morose. Uh, Nina Ansaroff, you know, like, these are two close of fights. Even her victory over Livia Hanato Souza. So, I will look into it, uh, but uh, it could go either way. I'm going to go Angela Hill by decision. Uh, I think she, you know, keeps her on the feet and uh, wins at least two rounds uh, to be able to get the victory here. I love Ronda Marcos, so I hate picking against her, but you got to do what you fucking got to do. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next women's fight of the night, which is Alexis Davis versus Jennifer Maya. Alexis Davis, you know, a vet. She has over 27 fights now. She's been a vet since fucking, or she's been a pro since 2007. So she's been in the game for about 12 years. I think she was a mom at a certain point uh, between that as well. Um, so... I have trouble with this fight just because, like, Jen Jennifer Maya is a, is a very good striker, you know, or, you know, a very aggressive striker. She packs some power in her punches, um, you know, she's coming from that shoot-to-box style. Uh, a lot of decisions on her record, uh, but very impressive, you know. She lost her last fight to Liz Carmouche uh, due to Carmouche just being a little bit better with the grappling aspect of it. You know, there was a, a weird moment where, like, uh, Jennifer Maya had like a a, a bra malfunction or an outfit mal malfunction, and uh, and Liz Carmouche capitalized on it. You know, she looked down to kind of like fix her bra, and fucking Carmouche comes in for a takedown and pretty much controls the rest of that round. I think I believe it was the third round, uh, just from on top. So I believe Alexis Dave. You know, what we saw in her fight against Kayla Trukagan, she doesn't mind staying on the feet until that third round where she actually tried going for takedowns, but. The first two rounds, you know, it was her just getting pieced up on the feet. And I don't think that Jennifer Maya has the, the type of movement that Caitlin Chukagian kind of presents to the situation. Um, but I think she packs enough power to make Alexis Davis a little bit hesitant to close the diff distance. Um, there is the, you know, the, the potential of... Alexis Davis getting a hold of Jennifer Maya, and I don't think that Maya has the greatest takedown defense per se, but I think that Alexis Davis is a girl that could potentially get her down. Um, I don't have like too deep of a, a breakdown for this fight particularly, but I'm gonna favor Alexis Davis just because like she is quite tough. You know, she she did eat a lot of shots from Caitlin Chukagian and kind of just ran through them. I know Jennifer Maya packs a little bit more of a punch. Uh, but she's been in, you know, she's eaten a lot of shots. That Ronda Rousey one was weird as fuck. But regardless, outside of that one, she she has a pretty decent chin. And I think that she's going to be able to eat a couple shots from Jennifer Maya, uh, get the clinch, get the takedown, and just work her jiu-jitsu, uh, where I think she'll have a very clear advantage there. So I'm going to go with Alexis Davis by decision. But uh, what's her odds at? Minus 162, I don't know. I just, I just, it's, I find it hard to bet Alexis Davis in 2019. So this fight's actually just going to be a pass for me. Next fight is a fight that I've already broken down, <laughs> but got pulled, unfortunately. Let me just wet it up. <sighs> Much better. <clears throat> All right. So. Marlon Vera against Frankie Science. If you guys remember, I, I believe I put 1 or 1.5 units on Frankie Science the first time these guys were supposed to square off. Unfortunately, I believe it was Marlon Vera that wasn't able to get cleared by the commission last minute, and he had to get, get pulled for the fight, and uh, Frankie Science was left without an opponent that night. However, two or three weeks later, they are back at it. 
And uh, my opinion has not changed at all. <laughs> uh, so, like, if you want to, I'm sure I may miss certain things that I did uh, break down in that first breakdown of this fight. So make sure you guys just go back. And uh, let's see, which event was that? UFC 235. So just go back to the UFC 235 podcast uh, and just go to the Frankie Signs and Marlon Vera one, just in case I miss anything. I didn't feel the need to just get back too, di too deep back into this matchup since I just tested our... Just fucking studied it. Uh, but, you know, with Frankie Sands, we're getting a guy, you know, maybe a little bit up there in age, but he, uh, you know, he has a very good style against a guy like Marlon Vary here. So, uh, you know, very grapple-heavy style, uh, very good wrestler, good pressure. Uh, the only negative thing you can really say about him, again, is his age. He is up there. Uh, I believe he's in his late 30s, 38. Yeah, he's 38. Uh, it would be 39 in August. But I believe he has a style and forward pressure to beat a guy like Marlon Vera. You know, Marlon Vera is not the biggest puncher. Yeah, he does have a finish over uh, fucking Uli Jibiran by a body punch. I uh, beat Guido Canetti. Uh, but then he lost to the John Linekers, uh, <laughs> a.k.a. John Lineker and Douglas Andrade Silva so, uh, Andrade, whatever the fuck his name is. Uh but I think that Frankie Sines is going to be able to control the clinch situations. He's going to get a hold of Marlon Vera and take him down. I don't think he needs to worry about the submission game too much of Marlon Vera, who, you know, decent jiu-jitsu game, I'll give him that. I think Frankie Sines is just well-versed enough on the uh, on top to stay out of any type of submissions that uh, Marlon Vera tries to throw up. Uh, but I, I still got Frankie Sines here, man. I think that he's just going to grind out Marlon Vera here. I've never been impressed with Marlon Vera. I've never, you know, think he... I've never really thought he's, like, UFC level either. Uh, you know, his biggest win to date, what is, what, fucking Brian Kelleher, Brad Pickett. Brad Pickett fight, you know, Brad Pickett over the, over the hill at that point in 2017. He doesn't really have, like, that standout win, you know. A loss to... Marcos Beltran way back in 2014 is just I know I know that's a long time ago and it's a completely different Marlon Vera but I've never been impressed with this guy so I think that Marlon Vera, uh, Frankie Frankie Sainz is going to get the W here by decision so the one thing that I will give uh, Marlon Vera is his ability to uh, take a beating because he's never been finished <laughs> all right so my play for that or my pick well, actually I may have a play on this actually is going to be uh, 1.5 units on <coughs> Marlon Vera or <sighs> Frankie Sainz. I just want to kind of see where the odds go throughout the week right now. I can get him roughly at minus 135-ish, minus 138. So no rush on that still. You know, it's only Monday, so I want to see where the odds go. Hopefully, you know, the betters <laughs> out there don't go fucking smash that line. But I don't think there's no lock of the night bomb or lock of the night pull yet for those odds. Uh yeah, so that moves us right on to our next fight, which is Bobby Moffitt versus Bryce Mitchell. Bobby Moffitt coming off of four straight wins, beat Enrique Gonzalez, Jonathan Jackson, Jacob Kilburn on the Contender Series, uh, and then uh, beat Chas Skelly in his last fight, beat Chas Skelly in his last fight by Darce Choke. Um, you know, there wasn't much to take from that Chas Skelly fight, in my opinion. You know, that whole first round was kind of just Chas Skelly uh, riding his back. You know, they're in a weird position where Chas Skelly was trying to get the, you know, a rear naked choke or at least just control from the top and eventually get this fight to the ground somehow. Um, maybe sink in a rear naked choke. But, you know, Bobby Muffin did really good in terms of just, you know, waiting it out no matter how boring it was. Didn't want to give up an inch or anything like that just to, you know, give up a potential choke. And then in the second round, we see it kind of go a different way where uh, Bobby Moffitt catches a darts choke in a, in a transition uh, and then we get that unfortunate situation because who knows how that could have gone, you know. Bobby Moffitt could have actually gotten the sub uh, or Shaz Kelly could have actually gotten out and we could have seen a little bit more of Bobby Moffitt around there. But, you know, the Jacob Kilborn fight, even though again, that guy was 6-1, and one, it just, in my opinion, wasn't quality competition for a guy like that. Uh, Bobby Moffitt was like minus 350 going into that fight. So, you know, say what you want to say about his last two performances. I, I'm still kind of sold on the guy, you know. I, I got to go back and watch a little bit more fights, but I, I'm kind of sold on him. He's kind of lanky. He has, you know, good good setups for his chokes. Um, great corner with Ben Henderson and uh, John Crouch at the MMA lab down there. Um, I think he has a ton of potential, and I think he should be able to beat a guy like Bryce Mitchell. Uh, Bryce Mitchell, you know, he's 9-1 and one, or 10-0. and 0, What the fuck? Oh, yeah, he beat uh, Tyler Diamond. <laughs> I 
I don't know why the fuck I thought that was a. Uh, I, I thought he lost that fight, but regardless, he's ten and zero now. Uh, you know that fight with Tyler Diamond was very interesting. You know, it was a majority decision for uh, Bryce Mitchell there, but uh, you know, very closely contested fight. You know, Tyler Diamond. I was kind of very, uh, I was underwhelmed with his takedown defense. I thought, as a wrestler and such a physically imposing wrestler as well, I thought he would have a better job of you know shucking off any type of attempts that Bryce Mitchell had. But Bryce was able to get him down with you know relative ease. Uh, another thing, you know, when D- Tyler Diamond did have Bryce Mitchell down, uh, Bryce Mitchell did always kind of you know look to get back up, uh, look for some sort of submissions. But I probably wouldn't say they're the most you know full hearted submission attempts or anything like that so i don't know if bobby moffitt's going to have much to worry about there i'd also give bobby moffitt the kind of the the edge on the feet as well um i lean bobby moffitt here but i don't know if i would play him uh if i would play him at uh what is he minus 180 i gotta look into a little bit more i do lean bobby moffitt um and i think this could be an easy fight for him as well but i gotta i really gotta look into a little bit more uh but i'm just not overly impressed with bryce mitchell either um yeah, that's all I can really say about that fight. I don't have too much uh, in-depth shit about that fight, but I'm going to go with Bobby Moffitt by decision here uh, to hand Bryce Mitchell his first loss. Next up, we got Macy Barber versus J.J. Aldridge. Uh, very, 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 very intrigued by this fight, especially that the fact that the fucking odds are a little bit wider than I expected them to be. Minus 230 for Macy Barber, plus 200 for J.J. Aldridge. Um so Macy Barber, you know, we're getting a really young girl. Uh, she's roughly 20 years old. Uh, and she's getting thrown into the limelight really fucking soon, in my opinion, at least. You know, she made her pro debut uh, June 2017. And she made her UFC debut uh, in November 2018. So what is that? Fucking 12, 17 months. Within 17 months, she was in the UFC. You know, she's cute. She's entertaining you know most of her fights have been a finish besides her second fight um she has good footwork good striking uh a very aggressive you know ground game uh i'm very impressed with what i see of her but with a girl like jj aldridge you know this is a girl that kind of makes things very grindy and gritty and 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 dirty <laughs> that sounds so bad but you know just look back at the Poliana Vienna fight. You know she she kept the feet on the kept the fight on the feet as much as possible, controlled clinch situations, and then got the fight to the ground when she needed to to secure that round, uh, and was able to stay out of a lot of you know uh, a lot of Poliana Vienna's jujitsu, which was highly touted going into that fight. You know I was very surprised that JJ Aldrich was the underdog in that fight, and you know I I spotted that and I hit that shit right away, and and it paid off. Um, She's going to have a little bit hard of a trouble, harder time here against Macy Barber because I believe Macy Barber has a better striking, range management, and footwork than Poliana Viana did. So it might be a little bit harder for J.J. Aldrich to actually get a hold uh, of Macy Barber. Um, but I have seen situation where, situations where uh, Macy Barber gets held against a cage against girls like Hannah Cyphers. You know, she's a smaller girl, but she's a tank. She's quite powerful. So I think that J.J. Aldrich is kind of the same way. She may not be as cut and, and buff as Hannah Cyphers, but I think she does a really good job of holding girls against the cage and just chipping away with them, at, uh, chipping away at them with knees. And she could absolutely do that to Macy Barber here, you know. Plus 200 is kind of what I was looking at for J.J. Aldridge, so that might actually be a, pl- a play. I'm, I'm I'm picking Macy Barber to win. I believe she has all the tools to win this fight, and I think that her footwork will be enough here to keep her out of these situations. But if you're going to give me plus 200 on J.J. Aldridge, who's been, you know, she's been fighting uh, the tougher girls out there. She's been, you know, putting in the work. She Her only loss is Juliana Lima, which was her first UFC fight, so I'll, I'll, I'll let her go on that one. Uh, and that was only, that was three weeks after she fought in Invicta, so say what you want about that, but, uh, you know, she's beaten uh, Chan Mi Jion, Danielle Taylor, and Poliana Vienna, uh, and now she's going up a young, going up against a young upstart in Macy Barber, so my pick is going to be 
Macy Barber by decision. I think that she outstrikes uh, JJ Aldridge, but she won't be able to put her out. I think Aldridge is very tough, and she'll be able to withstand any of the strikes that Macy Barber's throwing her way. Uh, but I might bet JJ Aldridge. Uh, just based off of value alone, uh, the threats that she would be able to bring into this fight. So, uh, take what you want from that. You know, I may, I, I'm gonna wait and see where this Macy Barber and uh, JJ Aldrich line goes because there's a lot of love on May Macy Barber. So we might even see JJ Aldrich get into like the plus two fifty range or something. That might be a little crazy. Maybe plus two twenty five, but just wait and see because the hype apparently is real out there for Macy Barber. So I think if you're a JJ Aldrich believer, just sit tight and just wait for those odds to get better. So official pick, Macy Barber by decision, but potential bet on J.J. Aldrich. Next up, we got Luis Pena against Steven Peterson. All right, okay. <laughs> Luis Pena is somehow going to go down to 145 pounds. We're talking about a guy that stands at 6'3", with 78-inch reach, and he wants to go down to 145. He looked like death trying to make 155. And he thinks that he can make 145 with relative ease. I'm sure it's going to be a bitch, but I do not trust Luis Pena, who just laid an egg in his last fight against Mike Trezano. You know, split decision, albeit, but he's coming here at minus 293, so let's say minus 300. I don't think that's that's warranted for a guy. You know, Luis, don't get me wrong. I believe Luis Pena has a lot of great things ahead of him. I think 155 might be the spot for him to be, you know, to be successful. So I have absolutely no idea why he wants to kill himself and go down to 145. But, you know, he is a beast. He has a lot of potential. That was only his sixth fight. Fifth, seventh fight. Okay, I'm talking pro fights. <laughs> that was his sixth fight against Mike Trezano. You know who was currently seven and zero at the time, so they rel relatively had the same type of ex type of experience. But I still think that Luis Green, Luis Pena, is quite green. I think that he, you know, he shows flashes of brilliance where he can mix in his wrestling because I think he has a really good wrestling game. But once he really gets into the the comfort of using his full length and body and his his reach, he's going to be a fucking problem. You know, he could actually go out. He could absolutely go out there and start Steven Peterson here. And finish him in the first round. Because I don't think Steven Peterson is that good. Uh, but I don't think you can justifiably bet Luis Pena at minus 300. Or even parlay him after the performance that he just had. And take into consideration that he's coming down a weight class. So I'm going to go with... Uh, I'm going to go with Luis Pena by first round finish here. But if it get past, gets, gets past for, uh, the second round... <sighs> Things are going to get hairy because I think that Steven Peterson is going to be able to put on a pace, you know, and beat up the body of Luis Pena um, and make it a tough fight for him. And that, that weight cut's really going to come into impact after that first round. But I think that he's good enough to finish a very hittable and one dimensional ish, not one dimensional. I'm sorry, that's too much of an offensive term to Steven Pearson. But he has the experience, he has 24 fights, this is going to be his 25th fight. Uh, you know, he has good stand-up, but his striking defense relaxed quite a lot. So he has to make sure he doesn't get hit by a heavy shot by Luis Pena. Um, and he has a decent ground game. So I don't know if he'll be in too much trouble if they were this were to hit the ground. I think that, you know, if, if Luis Pena ends up in full, full mount, you know, he's going to rain down some elbows and probably get a TKO there. But uh, I just don't... I, I can't trust Luis Pena at minus 300, and I can't justify placing money on Steven Pearson just because I just don't think he's that good. So pass for me, not even parlaying Luis Pena. The weight cut is too much of an X factor to actually put money on Luis Pena here. So I'm passing on that. But my play is going to be, or my pick is going to be Luis Pena by first round finish. Next up, a fight that I'm super fucking excited for. I heard somebody on, or saw somebody on Twitter earlier this week saying this is the most excited they've been for a non-flyweight title, or a non-title flyweight fight. And I gotta fucking agree. Jo Jussier Formiga versus Davison Figueredo is gonna be a fucking great fight. We're pretty much getting, you know, Jussier Formiga versus Evil Jussier Formiga, whatever the fuck you guys wanna call it. I love, I, fuck. Whoever made that meme or that photo, that picture of John Lineker with the fucking Formiga on one side and, 
uh, Davison on the other, please tweet that shit to me, at MMALOTN on Twitter, please send that shit to me. That shit was fucking hilarious because it's perfect. These guys look like identical brothers. They must be fucking related somehow. They've got to be. Like, <laughs> Anyway. With Formiga, you're getting a guy coming off of three win or three straight wins uh, before he had lost to um, Ray Borg, or after he lost to Ray Borg. Uh, he got uh, two rear naked chokes against Alko Sasaki and Ben Nguyen, uh, and then he took Sergio Perez to a decision. I believe I bet him in that fight, so that was great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that was that. I had Sergio Perez. Oh, sorry, I had um, Juicy Formiga there. And he did exactly what I thought he was going to do in that fight. You know, he, he took his time, eventually got Sergio Perez to the ground, and then kind of just controlled him there. His top pressure is just so fucking amazing. I, I, I really believe in that. The only knock that I'll give Juicy Formiga is he's not the best at getting the fight to the ground. He's kind of lucky that Sergio Perez has a lacking takedown defense game. Uh, and I think that's where he's going to run into trouble against Davison Figueredo here. I think that Davison has a great stand-up game, throws heat in every fucking punch, uh, and... I think that he's going to be good enough to thwart any type of takedown that Jose Formiga throws at him uh, and, you know, make Formiga pay for closing the distance as well with some heavy shots. Uh, and I think that he has a good enough jiu-jitsu game that even if this fight does get taken to the ground, I don't think that uh, he'll get submitted by Jose Formiga, you know. Say what you want about that Jared Brooks fight. He was able to get up numerous times, but he got taken down pretty easily. However... I don't think that Juicy Formiga has the wrestling takedown um, uh, technique and ability that Jared Brooks had. You know, Jared Brooks is a you know well-documented wrestler, uh, very strong wrestler, was always able to pretty much get almost all of his opponents to the ground. Uh, you know, but I don't see Juicy Formiga having that same kind of uh, explosiveness. Um, technical ability to get this fight to the ground uh, against the stronger guy in Davison Figueredo in my opinion and I think that Davison is just gonna you know have some fun on the feet you know I think he's gonna be able to throw some heat um, and not worry, worry too much about getting taken down but if it gets into clinch and you know clinch positions and, and those tight positions I think he's still gonna be able to land some big shots while throwing any type of takedown that Juicy Formiga is gonna throw at him so when this fight was actually announced you know I was very high on Juicy Formiga and was very confident that he was gonna be the underdog here too however after looking at the tape, you know, Davison's the real fucking deal, man. I, I'm, I'm very impressed with him. He's he's coming off that finish of John Moraga in his last fight. Um, you know, he's been finishing a lot of guys with body shots. Um, the Joseph Morales fight was another fight where he, like, you know, great combination against the cage and fucking finished him there. I'm, I'm very, very impressed with Davison Figueredo. I think that he's the next threat for that, uh, that flyweight title. I think a win over Josiah Formiga here should secure that for him. You know, maybe I think Benavides is going to get the next shot at at Suhudo if they end up going with the you know actual th actual correct order of things and actually you know get the flyweight champion to defend his title. But the winner of this fight definitely deserves a title shot. I don't know who else would be up there to uh, to say otherwise. So my my pick is I'll give Formiga the benefit of the doubt. I think he's quite um, I think he's quite durable. You know, Joseph Benavides was able to finish him and John Dodson. I think that, that Davison has the ability to finish him. I don't I don't know if he will. So I'm going to take Davison by decision, uh, which, should set him, which should set him up for a title shot right after that. So Davison Figueredo by decision. And maybe a bet. Maybe. Depending on where that line goes, which currently sits at. Minus 147, Davison. Oof. He's getting there. I'm, I'm going to stay patient and see where that fucking goes. All right, next up, we got Jesus Pinedo against John McDessey. So Jesus, Jesus Pinedo is coming off his UFC debut where he was able to beat Devin Powell by decision in a very underwhelming fight. You know, he has this weird, like, dancing style where he f looks like he's in, like, a groove in. Whatever. All power to him. If he, you know, if he's comfortable fighting like that, all, 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 all good. Uh, you know, luckily for him, he was going up a guy. He was going up against a guy in Devin Powell who just doesn't have the best striking, and is too comfortable laying on his fucking back. You know, there was a lot of points where Jesus, Jesus Pinedo was, uh, you know, just standing over him, throwing leg kicks just to score points. 
Um, and Powell was just too comfortable off his back. You know, he, he gave up a lot of time just laying on his back uh, when Jesus Pinedo was able to, you know, kick out his legs from under him, you know, trip him or something like that. He did, he wanted to get the fight to the ground. I think he believed he had a better uh, advantage on the ground, which I kind of, you know, agree with. But, you know, Jesus didn't seem that stupid that he would be like, you know what, let me Danny Roberts this shit and fucking get into his guard. He did not, you know. In this fight against John McTessie, he's coming up against, or he's fighting a much, much better striker. I think he's going to have some issues here with John McDessie. I think John McDessie is just going to be the cleaner, crisper, uh, more output, uh, and more diverse striker here against Jesus Pinedo. Is probably just going to be completely baffled by what the fuck is coming at him. You know, John McDessie has always been that gatekeeper kind of guy, and he's going to keep the gate closed against this guy in Jesus Pinedo. Um, Mike Tyson coming off of two wins over Abel Trujillo and uh, Ross Pearson. You know, he hasn't been the most active guy in the last couple of years, uh, but I think he's always a, a tough out for most guys. I think he will have, uh, you know, I think he'll have Jesus Pinedo's number here on the feet. I think he just mixes it up too well, throws in leg kicks every now and then to, to mix things up. Um, and just a better striker, you know. He may get hit by Jesus a couple times here, but I think that he'll just land often, early and often, uh, and it's going to be uh, too much for Jesus. So I think I'm going to take Jesus, uh, John McDessie by decision here. But with that said, I would not uh, bet him at minus 300, which is what he currently sits at. So I think that's just too steep of a price. Uh, so I'm going to pass on that fight. But I got John McDessie by decision. Co-main event time. Let's see. Curtis Blades versus Justin Big Pretty Willis. Let me wipe my nose. <sighs> All right, Curtis Blades coming off a devastating loss to Francis Ngannou back in November. You know, before that, he put together a very good stretch after he lost to Francis Ngannou that first time. <laughs> A little bit of an itch. <laughs> Regardless, Curtis Blades here uh, beat Cody East, had a no contest against Adam Milstead due to weed. Fuck you guys. Uh, Damio, Daniel Omio Lanchuk, Alexei Olenek, Mark Hunt, Alistair Overeem. Brutal finish over Alistair Overeem. And then uh, the loss in 45 seconds to Francis Ngannou back in Beijing in November. So he's coming back against a guy in Justin Willis who's been putting together a lot of, you know, impressive wins. They haven't been the prettiest wins. Ha, ha, ha. But he's been able to outstrike these guys with uh, footwork, a good jab, uh, and output pretty much. You know, he outstruck Mark Hunt, made it a very difficult fight. He pretty much outstruck Mark Hunt, which is absolutely absurd. But, you know, we know what Mark Hunt wants to do. He wants to land that big bomb, doesn't really throw punches and bunches, and that's where Justin Willis kind of had his number. In most of his fights, he's just been able to, you know, touch these guys up, get in and out, not get hit, which is very weird to see considering the fact that this guy does not look like a guy who has the physique of a guy who's able to implement that type of game plan uh so with justin willis i mean i'm interested to see if he's going to be able to shock off any type of takedowns that curtis blades tries to throw at him in any of the footage that i currently have of him especially what i put on the tape index there is no situation where you see anybody shoot for any type of takedown on Justin Willis. So we have no idea what the fuck we're going to see or expect when Curtis Blades eventually goes for that definite takedown. I don't know if Justin Willis has the power to put Curtis Blades out. You know, he has finished Alan Crowder in the fin uh, in the past. Uh, he beat another guy, Giuliano Coutinho, back in WSOF in 2016 by uh, punches. But I don't know if... You know, there there is also a concern of Curtis Blades' chin, so that could be something to factor in here. And the fact that we don't know what Justin Willis's takedown game looks like is gonna what is gonna kind of dictate, uh, you know, where this goes. I just want to pull up the odds real quick because uh, I thought they were kind of absurd. Plus two forty one for Justin Willis, minus two sixty nine for Curtis Blades. This is a fight that I'm considering an underdog pick on as well. Um, I think the odds are way too wide, even though we don't know what Justin Willis's takedown de or defense is like. But, you know, a guy who's been so successful on the feet, I truly think that he's worth a shot here. Um, 
against the Curtis Blades, who's coming off a knockout loss in, uh, in November. Curtis Blades could absolutely come out here and ragdoll Justin Willis, throw him around for three rounds and just make him his bitch. Absolutely possible. Uh, but I don't think that warrants a minus 270 favorite. Um, it's, it's interesting to see what Curtis Blades is going to look like after coming back from such a devastating loss. We've never really seen him come back from a devastating loss like that. You know, even in his first Francis Ngannou fight, it was just due to a cut. He probably could have gone on. Maybe got to finish later in the fight. But uh, here, you know, he's coming off a 45-second loss to Francis Ngannou. So, uh, Justin Willis, I believe, will land on Curtis Blades. The question of Justin Willis' takedown is the most intriguing factor here because it's something we've never seen. But I will would still take a chance on uh, Justin Willis above plus 250. So if I see that number hit that point, I might take a shot. Nothing too big, maybe a unit, maybe half a unit or something. But I think there's definite value there uh, over a guy that we've seen look nothing short of, you know, good. Like, pfft. he looks good. He, he he does the bare essentials to win in most of his fights, but he gets it done. He doesn't make it look pretty, which is fucking hilarious because his nickname is Big Pretty. But he's still... You know what? Technically speaking, if you like look at it from a coach's perspective, it does look pretty. But to the average casual fan, it doesn't look pretty. With that said, I'm going to take a... Uh, fuck. Fuck it. Let's get ballsy. I'm going to take Justin Willis by decision here. I think he does exactly what he does and did in his last couple fights. Just completely outpoint the guy. Um, you know, have good enough footwork to be able to evade Curtis Lade's takedowns. Um maybe be heavy enough and strong enough against the cage to uh, fend off any type of takedowns that Curtis Blades goes for. But, I could, again, I could be completely wrong. He may have the most dog shit takedown defense. I can't confidently say that I know that Justin Willis will shuck off all these takedowns uh, that are inevitable from Curtis Blades. So, just to be fucking that guy, I'm going to take Justin Willis by decision here. Uh, and obviously a possible bet if he hits even that plus 250 range. All right, co-main or main event time. All right, I'm giving that shit three horns out of five due to the fact that it's an intriguing fight stylistically, but it makes absolutely zero fucking sense. Um... Stephen Thompson, you know, I believe he's coming off that Darren Till loss. Yeah, he's coming off that Darren Till loss, which before he beat Jorge Masvidal, who just knocked out Darren Till this past weekend, and then before that had those two uh, fights that probably everybody wants to forget against Tyron Woodley. Um, so I think this fight is more so for Stephen Thompson's confidence. You know, I think if he can get a win under his belt against the name even if it's in front, a guy from a different division, I think it will be good for his confidence alone. Um, you know, he's going to be the bigger guy here. He's going to be the more technical guy on the feet, in my opinion. I think he might have the better counter-striking here as well. Um, but it's going to be a very sty interesting stylistic matchup against a guy who kind of has that karate-ish taekwondo style as well in, in, in Anthony Pettis. Um, like I said at the top of the show, you know, this could be a fight where these two guys kind of just stare at each other and just wait till the other guy throws and they might just throw pitter-patter leg kicks and it might just be a fucking staring contest for five rounds. But I think that Stephen Thompson might have the the a little extra oomph or a little extra... <laughs> I'm trying to find the word. A little extra reason to go for that, uh, to, to pull the trigger, just to, you know just to be impressive and like I said at the top of the show to to showcase his dominance of his this being his weight class and he's not going to lose to a guy coming up from a different weight class you know so stylistically you know Stephen Thompson again very wide stance likes to bounce around on his tippy toes a little bit um tippy toes <laughs> on his tiptoes uh and you know just kind of dart in with a quick straight shot um you know throw awkward kicks Anthony Pettis kind of does the same thing too, but in his own little weird style. So uh, it all comes down to who pulls the trigger, who's more accurate, 
and uh, maybe even who is more active per se because again this may go to a five round decision and we may we might just see whoever threw the most punches or most kicks actually get the decision victory here but it's hard for me to see a scenario where Anthony Pettis actually does win this fight you know I know I teased a little bit earlier uh, or earlier this month that I was considering a bet on Anthony Pettis He's currently sitting at plus 380, which is fucking crazy. I would consider him at plus 400, but I, I don't know if I'd be able to pull the trigger at that point. I've lost a little bit of money on him, just, you know, being a little bit too confident in him. But some of these lines are just fucking absurd, you know what I mean? Like, pl- mine is 450 almost for Stephen Thompson is next level shit. But um, I am going to go by with Thompson by decision here, um, you know, or even, you know what, I'm going to go, ah, fuck. Uh, I'm interested to see what kind of pedis we get at, at uh, 170 pounds as well. So I'm going to I'm gonna sat on this, uh, or err on the side of caution and think that pedis is a little bit more durable at uh, at 170. And we see Stephen Thompson, you know, do his point fighting and just, just win a decision, uh, win a convincing de- decision, we should say. Uh, so I'm going to go with Thompson by by decision. Um, but if you're feeling a little risky and you see Anthony Pettis at that plus 400 mark, I wouldn't hate you totally for uh, putting a little bit of change on him it's from lunch money or something like that. Uh, but, uh, fuck, it's it's hard to trust Anthony Pettis. A guy who sees him, you know, we've seen mentally break on numerous occasions as well. It's hard to trust a guy with, that, with money anymore. Um, but at minus 450, I wouldn't even trust Stephen Thompson at those crazy odds as well. I've never been for, you know, I've never been the highest on parlays or anything like that. And those high parlays other than John McDessie, uh, you know, Luis Pena, Luis Pena, Curtis Blades, you know, those guys are more highly favored and they're pretty chalk. I just don't feel comfortable parlaying those guys. The only guy, you know, above minus 300 that I'm confident in parlaying would be John McDessie. But... Do as you guys please if you guys feel more confident in Stephen Thompson, but you won't see a parlay involving any one of those three guys, Stephen Thompson, Curtis Blades, or Luis Pena. But I'm going to take Stephen Thompson by decision. So that's pretty much it for the show. Man, that was a good one. I'm getting, like, I'm getting fucking happy Uh, or excited every day uh, to do the next episode and the next one and the next one like I just want to I want to continue to make the show better Uh, I love the the support and uh, you know compliments and stuff that everybody's been giving me I'm always open to constructive criticism as well so fucking hit me with that shit in the comments but you know I want to make this the best show possible for you guys Uh, I know as time continues to go on it will continue to get better I will be able, will be able to dedicate a little bit more time and add some cool extra things onto this to to make it even better. Um, and I'm excited to share those with you guys. But you know, I, it's just getting the time to do it right now and uh, currently locked up a little bit. But I will be free soon from this shit, and I will be able to provide you guys with some even better content, uh, some more uh, in depth breakdowns, something more visual to to you know make it more appealing. Uh, but also, if you guys are listening to this, some of you might be even listening through fucking audio right now, which is Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes. I got all that shit on lockdown now. I finally fucking figured that shit out, and we're finally on there. So either you're watching this on YouTube and you see my beautiful face right in front of you, uh, or you're listening uh, through those uh, one of those platforming uh, one of those platforming podcasts. One of those podcast platforms. Uh, and I appreciate you guys subscribing, liking, downloading, uh, retweeting, tweeting, liking, Facebooking, whatever the fuck it is. I much appreciate it. But make sure you guys subscribe on YouTube. I want to see that number go up. It's just a little bit of an ego fucking stupid thing for myself. But I just want to see that number go up. It, it just shows positive progression at all times. So make sure you guys do that for me. Uh, www.mmalotn.ca for everything that you need to do with me. Uh, but my hub and the heart and mind of this MMA Lock of the Night operation lives on YouTube. On, on, on YouTube, fuck me, man. On Twitter. So make sure you guys follow me on Twitter at MMALOTN. All my shit is there. All my picks will be there. All my thoughts are there. Um, you know, all my free picks are always posted there. So make sure you guys just go over there and check that out to see what I'm actually playing. Uh, but I will always try to post my picks in the comment section below uh, so you guys have that for reference too. But 
I always say, listen to my breakdowns before you guys actually take, you know, my picks in the, the comments as my final say, because that's not always my final say. There's always an asterisk to every fucking breakdown. So make sure if you want to bet on a certain thing that you see in my picks and why I lean that person, make sure you guys listen to the breakdown first, because I don't want you guys bitching and moaning, coming back and be like, why did you pick this guy if you don't think he's going to win? Fuck you. <laughs> okay? Watch the video. Put in the time. Uh, and I can help you make some money. But that's it for me. I'm done. I'm out. Peace.